the same archetypes. Before we went live, we were talking about how I had some experience with, let's say, some greater reality, maybe or not. It may be. And it, it provoked extreme anxiety in me. And then you told me, well, Kurt, I mean, that what I thought could be true, but it also could not be. And the mind is exceedingly deceptive. So what I'm wondering is, so is mind deceptive or is it just our narratives about the sensory data that becomes distorted or is mind at large somehow constitutionally deceptive? And if so, then how do we sort out what is true from what's not? What do we use as a barometer to guide our life? Is it divine revelation? Well, you already said, well, we have to do away with that. The thing is, most of the world we think we live in arises from our inner narratives, from our inner storytelling. Um, we don't see the world impartially at all. Uh, we tile it with narratives, with what we tell ourselves is going on. Um, and I think the deception that is the prime directive of mind is in weaving these narratives. It's not deceptive when it comes to what it is in itself because it's what it is. It cannot deceive itself uh, other than by telling itself a wrong story about what it is. <laughs> uh, but it cannot be deceiving itself in the sense of being something other than what it is. It is what it is, and that's what it is. You know, the, there is no escape from that. So in that sense, there is no deception. Whatever is, is, has always been, and whenever will always be. The problem well, is that we... Way. Sorry, here's one way that you can recover that it is what it is, and also that it's that it is necessarily distorted. Because let's imagine consciousness is a circle. I know this is foolish, but let's imagine it's a circle, and then it has ripples that come out. Somehow, maybe there's a, another law on top of this, that when the ripples come back to you, that chain is somehow not what it was when it left. So you could, all, you could recover that it's necessarily... It, that it's necessarily deceptive. And I think there's much of the Buddhist traditions that say something like this. Now, you'll know much more. So there you go. I'm well, throwing I'm, that I'm, out. I'll see what you say. I'm not an expert in Eastern philosophy at all, actually. Um, look, there are certain coherence constraints that can base a useful, practical theory of truth. Um, but those coherence constraints uh, necessarily, necessarily arise out of some collective engagement. Um, uh, so we can say that uh, given our stories, our collective stories about what is reasonable and what is evidentiary, we can eliminate certain things that are as untrue. And I think that's entirely valid. Not only valid, it's crucially necessary for social life. Otherwise, it would be completely dysfunctional. Uh, but I think at the bottom of it, of it all, there is just mind being mind and then telling itself narratives about what it is. And that's where the deception occur. Uh, um, it, it is Why in the narrative. It seems like it's, it's unadaptive, or unless it is adaptive, like you're saying. It's, it's highly adaptive. Truth. It's incredibly adaptive. You could say that without these narratives, nothing would be real. Uh, it is the process of self-deception that creates uh, any sense of objectivity and concreteness and reality. Uh, without those narratives you're always in, always resting in that awareness that whatever is arising is just you making it up. You see, the one mind in nature is making it all up for, for it to have a sense of reality. In, 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 in other words, and that's our intuition about what's real, is that which exists regardless of whether you believe it or not. That's our intuition about what's real. For that sense to exist you have to have some kind of narrative that creates boundaries in nature, that creates that which I am not and which unfolds independently of what I think, believe, or prefer. If you don't have that, there is no reality. There is no sense of reality. There is only the one mind knowing that it is the only thing going on and that whatever arises, it's thinking it up, which probably is the ultimate reality. Uh, but it, it's not a comforting reality, uh, is it? I call it the... When you glimpse that, I call it, um, um, the, the English word uh, escapes me, the vertigo of eternity, which is better described as the vertigo of timelessness, uh, because it is vertigo. Is that akin it's to the void that some people... It's Nietzsche's voice. Yeah. yeah. When you look long enough into it, it stares back at you. Um, it's what so what the does Buddhists that staring back at you void. mean? I understand that you can have the experience of the void. What, 
do you mean when you say that the void stares back at you? I know you're quoting Nietzsche, but what does it mean in your model? I'll tell you what I think Nietzsche meant, <laughs> okay? What Nietzsche meant is that if you stare enough in the, into the void of your own mentation, it seems to acquire a life of its own and become a separate agency. And as such, it stares back at you. It's, it sort of splits off from yourself and acquires objective reality. Um, Jung insisted that the archetypes were the objective psyche. And so it appeals to this sense of separation, of this sense of boundary creation that, uh, that creates what you are and what you are not, that which is inside and that's what is outside, that which is the self and that which is not the self, the subject and the object. Mm -hmm. And reality depends on the separation. Our sense of what is real depends on it because we intuit reality as that which does not depend on us. Uh, I think ultimately there is no such a thing. There is no such reality. The real reality is that it's mind making it all, uh, all up, not randomly, but by giving expression to its own favorite patterns of excitation, its own, its own harmonics, uh, um, because that's what it can do by virtue of being what it is. Uh, and then we place the narratives on that. And that narrative creates the, quote, reality of subject and object, um, which is extremely useful. It, 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 the richness of experience would be much less uh, if, if this were not the case. It, it is sense of separation, illusory as it may be, that creates the richness of existence, uh, that, crea that it, creates, it creates the human drama. It, it creates drama. Uh, 